Welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. We're here to bring you helpful information from leading experts and give you effective tools and support. I'm Jason Grigla, a licensed counselor and founder of Techie for Life, a specialized mentoring program for neurodiverse young adults. And I'm Debbie Grigla, a certified life coach. And maybe most importantly, we're also parents to our own atypical young adults. Friends, welcome. I want to talk to you today about decoding behaviors. And this is a an important topic, and I see a, a lot of you, a lot of the parents that I'm coaching and working with struggle with their interpretation of behaviors. And it's creating a lot of stress and frustration for many of you. And so I want to help you have a different lens, a different way to look at this, to be able to decode behaviors in a way that's more accurate and more helpful. And I want to give you an example of this. So we've just come to the end of the school year. My kids have finished school, my girls, and my experience of that end of school year time was so different than what it was with my boys. And because my three older boys were all, are all neurodivergent in different ways and um, and they also had like traumas and different things that, that played in. And what would happen is, you know, you've got tests coming up at the end of the school here and we're checking grades and my boys did not come to me. They didn't communicate. They didn't advocate for themselves. I had to go to them, right? I had to go and be always checking on them, checking their grades, talking to them. Uh, my one son, we had concerns whether he would graduate and I had to, <laughs> and, you know, it was teaching him how to think about it every day when he got home. What homework assignments do you have? What's due? What do you need to get done today? Let's chunk this down, kind of helping him organizationally. And then also managing a schedule because he, you know, with sports and different things. And if it, if I wasn't right in front of them and talking to them, they weren't bringing it up. It wasn't on their mind. They would forget or they would get anxious. Or if they asked for help, it was very intense and stressful. Totally different experience with my than with my daughter who comes to the end of the semester and she's like, Mom, you, you know, she would come to me and update me. She'd want to know, hey, I'm working on this and I've got this grade. Um, this one's low, but I know I can get it up if I get a couple of these assignments turned in or if I do a test retake or what what have you. And at the end of the semester, she's like, Mom, go go check my grades. And I went in to go check them and I realized that the app was not like loaded on my phone. It had been so long since I had actually gone in and checked her grades. And she's like, Mom, you don't even have it on your phone. I'm like, I haven't looked. I haven't checked up on you. I trust you. I know you're on top of it. You're communicating it to me and I don't worry about you. So different than what I was doing with, with my boys. And so, and the difference isn't that my boys wouldn't or didn't care about grades or were defiant. It was that they developmentally had different skills and had some weaknesses where my daughter just naturally has developed organizational skills and time management skills. And she's really good at utilizing her time well because she's in a dance company and she spends a lot of hours at dance and she only has a little bit of time to get homework done. So she has to be really efficient and get focused on it and get it in, get it turned in, know what things she can just kind of you know, it's good enough, turn it in and other things that she needs to spend more time on, but she knows how to manage her time. She's, she keeps track of all the different things that she has going on. And, and then she's also knows how to get her social emotional needs met. And she has a, a level of maturity, right? At a young age, um, that my boys struggled with in those areas. And so what I want to talk to you about is how to decode these types of behaviors and see them through a lens that's actually supportive to you and to them. That can help you know how to best support your young person. And to do to be able to interpret behavior in a way that you can best support 
their overall de- development and their overall sense of well-being, their their level of stress management, if you will. And not get lost in the wrong things, interpreting things wrong and losing sight of the big picture. Okay. So being able to have a framework to be able to interpret behavior and then what to do with it, how to help, how to support. That's what I want to go into with you for this episode. So there's a lot of different developmental like models and, and, um, things that show different stages. So for example, there's Erickson's stages of development. And you don't have to know all of these things to be a good parent, but it can be helpful to recognize that there are stages and you can't just sort of skip over things or when there's gaps or differences in how someone has developed through those stages, there, there's an impact on their life and how capable and how functional that they can be. And so, for example, with with Erickson's Erickson's stages of development, you've got infancy where they're a baby is learning to trust the adult in their life and depend on them. And some babies don't get that. They don't have consistent quality care happening. And so there's like this distrust that starts to um, become part of their development. And then when you get into like toddlers and um, like toddlerhood, where they're starting to, to develop their own autonomy and do things for themselves, that's a really important stage. And we all like joke about, oh, the terrible twos, but that's a really important developmental stage where a child is is starting to like, I want to, like, I want to do it myself. No, I do. Right. And if they aren't able to do that, or if they're shamed for how they did it, they start to develop more of like shame and doubt about their ability versus like confidence and like a sense of a little bit of a sense of autonomy. And in preschool, they're starting to, to, to take initiative and try new things. And, and if, if they're not successful in that, or if they're in an environment that is harsh or shaming, they start, start to just feel guilt instead of like initiative. And so it goes through these stages, right? Elementary school, they're learning new skills and they're learning how to be successful. And so that's an important stage and where they're either getting confidence, gaining confidence, or they're getting like becoming more insecure. In adolescence, they're starting to figure out who they are and and, um, what they want to do with their life. And at that stage, they're, they're forming their identity. And other kids, if they aren't able to to develop in that stage, they're actually get, experiencing a lot of role confusion, um, maybe gender confusion, and who are they and what are they in the world? They they don't have a place. They feel um, confused about that, insecure. And then in young adulthood, that's when they're starting to make big life decisions, like where to live and and what job they want to have. And it's also that stage where they're starting to look for more like intimacy in the relationships. And when that's not taking place, when that development isn't happening in a healthy way, that's where you can see a lot of feelings of isolation and a lack of intimacy, a lack of connection with others. And, you know, middle, middle adulthood is when you're starting to like focus on helping others and making a difference in the world. Like Jason and I are really in that stage where we just really have these strong desires to help others and, and make a difference, make a big impact. And this is where we're like generating ideas and and approaches and helps and supports and others in this, in this young adult time, my, my, or middle adulthood are maybe feeling lost and and not having that that purpose and you know in late adulthood there's either this you know you look at back on your life and you have a sense of pride and accomplishment and if you're not having that if there's regrets then there's going to be maybe ex- you experience a lot of despair and so when you look at these stages of development in the context of of understanding that these layer on each other, right? Being able to have some confidence with the things that you do and a sense of autonomy is like moving you towards when you can develop your own identity. But if you haven't 
developed well in those different through those different stages, you're going to struggle as you go along. And when you look at our autistic and our neurodivergent young people, they don't follow those stages the same way, or maybe in the same order, or they take longer in in the different stages. And so they might be just barely for a lot of our young adults. So that's when they're starting to maybe feel more autonomous and feel a sense of accomplishment and where they're really starting to form their identity. It's a little bit later. And so it's, it's important to understand that these developmental stages play into how they're going to show up in how they act and, and, and the way that they you know behave. And then there's other stages of development that play into things, especially for our, for our autistic and our neurodivergence, things like executive functioning, where it's your prefrontal cortex and where this is the part of your brain that is responsible and, and does the planning and time management and organizational skills. And it's where problem solving happens, um, working memory, emotional regulation, all of these things happen in the prefrontal cortex. And for our autistic and our neurodivergence, they have some dysfunction and they, they have struggle with their executive functioning skills. The brain isn't communicating um, to the other parts of the brain as well or as efficiently. And so when you look at the development of, say, time management, a toddler's sense of time is very, very basic. In fact, it's like, I want this now. <laughs> very immediate. And then in elementary school, maybe like neurotypical children are getting more of a sense of like when recess is going to be or how long something might take. And then in adolescence, time management might look like what I was describing earlier with my daughter. Like I've got this and I have this to do and I'm going to be here, you know, at dance from this hour to this hour. And so I have this much time to get homework done. And how can I like get this assignment done quickly? Like more complex time management planning, you know, working memory happening. And if someone struggles with that, they are maybe at a lower, more basic stage of the executive function skills. And so we, we, you want to be aware, and you don't have to go into all the details of all of it, but you want to have some understanding about planning. There's different levels and, and complexity of planning. There's different levels of time management and understanding of time. There's, there's different levels of problem solving skills and ability. And, and then you add in things like emotional intelligence and emotion regulation skills, which I've talked about on previous episodes. And a young person who's autistic or neurodivergent is going to maybe need more support longer to be able to develop those skills and their behavior. That's going to be reflected in their behavior. Their ability to manage their emotions, to to manage their time, their organization, problem solving, these are all developmental skills that that take time and build on each other. And so when we're looking at behaviors and understanding behaviors, I highly encourage you to make that shift into viewing behaviors through a developmental lens to not see it as a case of they won't do something and they're being defiant and being bad, but to view those behaviors, not from won't, but that they can't yet. Okay. That they haven't developed that skill yet. And to, to keep in mind the different factors that play into successful development or the continued growth of development. And what we typically think of development, it's their age. Well, we know with neurodivergence, their age is is not going to be indicative of their developmental stage. Their development is indicative of where they're at developmentally, not their age. But we tend to have these biases when we interpret behavior that a three-year-old should behave a certain way, or an eight-year-old should be behaving a certain way, or a 15-year-old should be behaving a certain way. And that's not accurate. Sometimes our bias is their size. And I've I've maybe mentioned that before, but I've got like a daughter that's super tiny. And so people think she's going to be younger and behave younger than she is. And then you get to know her and you realize she's really mature and really socially capable and very bright. And and she's actually probably developmentally ahead of her chronological age and for sure, like than her size, right? There's also developmental experiences. 
development happens over time through experience. And if you haven't had broader experiences, you're not going to have that broader development. And so that plays into it. What kind of experiences has someone had? And and then you look at, you know, their actual disabilities and how that plays into their development and what stage in development are they at. And it can be kind of all over the place. I mean, that's why you can have an autistic kid or a neurodivergent kid that that at a really young age, like they're the toddler that's like doing math problems and can count and and do kind of upper level math at a really young age. But then socially, they're having meltdowns and they're missing social cues and they think everyone's against them or they're bullying them when when it's just normal child play or maybe, or maybe they are getting bullied because they don't know how to stick up for themselves and so there's like social things happening that don't match like their math academic ability like there's a discrepancy there and so we want to like break that up a little bit and not just put every 8-year-old in an 8-year-old box but actually start to interpret things through a developmental lens of where are they at developmental, where are they at developmentally? And there's different variations in that and to start noticing those things. And then to start looking at their behaviors as a clue to where they're at developmentally. And so, for example, like stu- we'll have students that come to Techie for Life and they can, they can talk a big game. They've got big goals and they're very articulate and they, they can talk circles around <laughs> people. But then you look at what they actually do, and that paints a different picture, right? So just because they can talk it doesn't mean that they are actually capable of doing it. They might know the right things to say, but they actually haven't developed the skills to do the thing that they're talking about. And so we have to actually look at what they're doing. And then you want to look at how are they doing it? What does it look like as they're doing something? So are they super stressed when they're doing the thing, when they're performing an act or when they're engaging in an activity? What's their stress level? That's going to be really, that's going to really give you a clue about where they're at developmentally, because if they're highly stressed and doing something, that means they're really being stretched to the max. This isn't something that's like a skill that they've really nailed down, right? You know, if someone's developed a skill and they've got it because they can do it consistently and they can do it non-stressed, like relatively speaking, right? But if they're just doing it once in a while and they're stressed when they're doing it, you know they actually haven't developed that skill. I can jump on a bike if I've never ridden a bike and I can like focus really hard and tense up and like look like I'm trying to ride a bike. But if I'm super stressed and I'm putting all this effort into riding that bike, I I have not developed into a bike rider yet, (laughs) even if I can pedal a few feet, right? How do you know someone's developed the skill of of riding a bike because they get on the bike and it's effortless and they're looking around and they can they can go fast or slow and they can stop and they can make the turns and they can you know ride their bike in circles and go up on things and it's effortless like they're enjoying it maybe they're putting a little bit of effort right to, you know going uphill but but they can get on a bike and they're not thinking oh how do how do I keep my balance ah, ah, right it it just has been relegated to their subconscious it, they don't have to to be efforting it in a a strained mental capacity way. So behaviors are clues. And when you look at it through a developmental lens versus like a behavioral lens where you're looking at, oh, they're behaving badly, so I need to punish them or reward them to make them behave or do the thing that I want them to do, which is not accurate. If they're not doing a thing, most often it's because they can't yet, not because they won't. When you look at it through developmental lens, you're like, oh, they just haven't developed that skill. How can I support them? Where can I guide them? Why are they not able to do this skill? What's behind that? What what are they struggling with here? That's going to give you so much better information and direction to go off of. And so it helps inform your expectations when you look through things through a developmental lens, because development's messy. Like getting on a bike to learn how to ride a bike, you know, a kid will overcorrect one way and then they they try to balance the other way and they'll fall down and they scrape their knee and they're crying and then we try again and it's scary and and they'll start to get it and then they might freak out and 
Like development can look sometimes like two steps forward and one step back. And you're like, oh, we were just getting it and now we're going back. Well, it's probably because they were really efforting it and then they're a little tired. <laughs> or it might be because they're overcorrecting or they're trying too hard. Um, a lot of times it almost looks like a pendulum swinging back and forth and and we try too much one way. And then like with friends, we try too hard to be friends. And then, oh, that didn't go well. So we back off and now we don't have any friends. And then we try back again. And, and, and how do we engage socially? And that can look kind of messy and with lots of fails and mistakes. That's actually a normal part of development. And for development to happen, there's got to be a little bit of stress, a little bit of discomfort. And we don't want to judge our young person when they're in that, the middle of that discomfort, right? When they're in that kind of muddy middle where they're kind of struggling through and trying to figure it out. That's part of development. And there's, there's no rescuing them from that discomfort, but there are things we can do to be supportive. And one of those things is actually understanding what development actually looks like and, and starting to look at their behaviors through that developmental lens instead of a behavioral judgmental kind of lens, but like from an assessment lens, where are they at developmentally? Then you can be also looking at things through like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and recognizing, do are they having their basic needs met? Why can't they do this behavior today? Or why are they so emotionally dysregulated? Well, have they eaten? <laughs> you know, are they hangry? <laughs> are they tired? Are their basic needs being met? Do they feel safe or unsafe? Do they feel judged or loved unconditionally? Are their social needs getting met? Do they feel acceptable? Do they have friends? Do they have connections? And then you're like moving up the ladder, right? What, what would be the next thing? Do they Are they being able to have opportunities to have success? Are they being able to build evidences that they are good enough? <laughs> And you, you just keep moving up that ladder. So when we're looking at why they can't, well, I, I certainly can't perform my best when I'm when I'm hungry, when my blood sugar levels dropped, or if I haven't had a good night's rest, I certainly can't perform my best. I can't think as straight. I can't manage my time or my boundaries or do as much as I can do when I've had a full good night's rest. So it's when we look at what are we seeing behaviorally, we're looking at what are they needing? What's What's behind this? Is this a need, basic need not being met? Or is this just where they're at developmentally? And how can I support a sense of safety and well-being and opportunities for growth and development and to have success in their growth and development? I highly encourage you to start viewing and start trying on this lens of viewing behaviors through that developmental lens. And ask, and when you notice behaviors, what are you seeing? And what does that tell you about where, about where they're at developmentally? And what might they be needing? And is there something you can add support or not? I hope this is helpful. This is a game changer for me. I, I wish that I had had this lens to view my boys' behavior when they were younger. I, it would have completely changed the way I interacted, the level of demands and stress that I put on them, the level of stress and, and demands that I put on myself. And I think it would have had a much more enjoyable experience <laughs> raising them when they were younger than I did. And that's what I want for you. I want you to be able to have a, a positive experience, to be able to really delight in the young person that you're parenting or working with. And a big step in that direction is trying on this developmental lens where you're viewing those behaviors and you're decoding what are these behaviors telling you? And we're moving away from that negative, oh, they won't and they're being bad and I've got to make them do this thing to, oh, this is where they're at developmentally. That's interesting. What do they need to be able to move forward or to be less stressed? It's amazing. Just that little shift just opens you up to a whole new way to look, look at what supports are needed and, and what those can look like. So try on that lens and keep showing up here. And if you're finding this information helpful, do me a favor, go in and 
you know, give us a five-star review, maybe make a comment about something that's been helpful or an insight that you've gained that helps other people find this. And that's really what we want to do is we want to help as many people out there that are wanting to do a good job parenting and are struggling with it. We can do better for our kids and, and they need us to do better. We can grow and develop as the people influencing them. And this is our effort in that. And we would super appreciate you helping us in that effort to, to uh, rate this podcast and, and share it with your friends. And, um, and by all means, if there's certain topics or things that you're needing, I'd love to hear from you. You can email us. You can reach out to me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I'd love to hear if there's certain things that, that you're struggling with or you'd like to hear us talk about. Let's make a difference. Let's change the trajectory for our kids and for us and move in more positive directions that are actually supportive and actually get better results in the end. Hope you have a great week and take care. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. If you want to learn more about our work, come visit us at jasondebbie.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-E-B-B-I-E.com. dot